Hi folks, welcome back to the Tabletop's Edge. As you know, several months ago, I finally committed to learning the Gauss system. And while I haven't been able to spend as much time with it as I would have liked, I do think that I have spent enough time, both in the rulebook as well as pushing pieces across the map, uh, to be able to uh, start to talk about various aspects of the system, maybe what I like about them, things I perhaps don't like, compare them to some of the other operational level games out there. And speaking of which, uh, you are going to hear me reference both the Battalion Combat Series and the Operational Combat Series, OCS and BCS, uh, by MMP quite a bit in this series of videos. And that's uh, primarily because those are the two other operational level uh, series that I have the most experience with. I know there are some other popular operational level series out there, but I'm most comfortable with BCS and, uh, and OCS. And I do think that BCS is almost a perfect match uh, scale-wise for Gauss. Uh, if you look at both of those series, the primary unit in the series is the Battalion. The map scale is almost identical with one hex to the mile in Gauss and BCS. The hexes are either uh, anywhere from one mile to one kilometer, so very close in terms of map scale. And then in game turns, BCS, one game turn equals one day. Gauss does have three game turns per day, which at first glance might seem like not much of a match, but... In Gauss, at least one of those three game turns is uh, going to be a rest game turn for each side. So effectively, you've really only got two game turns per day in Gauss where your units can freely move and fight. Still, that sounds like, well, there's twice as many turns per, per day in Gauss versus BCS. However, in BCS, it is possible that a formation could get two activations in the same turn. So effectively being able to move and fight twice on that game turn or that game day, game day which really does kind of uh, match up really nicely, I think, with Gauss, uh, again, in terms of, uh, of the scale of the games. It's also interesting that BCS and Gauss have taken two radically different approaches to the to the game design. Uh, I would say they're almost kind of on opposite ends of the uh, of the design spectrum, if you will. And one thing that has surprised me is the fact that despite the games being so very different in their approach to the same subject matter, I really, really like both games. As you know from my channel, I'm a huge fan of BCS. I think it's got some really innovative and elegant mechanics. Some of the most interesting sort of out-of-the-box thinking I've seen in game design probably in the last few decades. Uh, Goss, on the other hand, while it's a more traditional design, is one that I think has been done very well. I'm really, really enjoying the detailed approach to it, and I'm finding that because of that detail and the way things are all uh, intertwined, that there's a lot of subtlety and nuance in Gauss that really doesn't kind of jump out at you at first uh, sight. So again, as I've been able to delve deeper into Gauss and get a better understanding of how the game works and, and what various things are uh, trying to do, various subsystems, I'm really liking Goss more and more, getting a, a much greater appreciation for it. Now, the other series you've heard me mention just now is the OCS. And I, OCS is not really necessarily a good match in terms of scale for Goss. It's at a, yes, it's an operational level game, but it's at a higher scale level. So, for instance, the, the game turns in OCS are half weekly turns, so three to four days versus a single day in Goss. The map scale, the hexes in OCS are anywhere from three to five miles as opposed to just one mile here in Goths. And even at the, the playing pieces, while there are battalions and a lot of battalions in OCS games, those are primarily limited to the mobile formations, things like Panzer Divisions or Tank Corps. And I would say that at its core, it's, OCS is more of a divisional level game versus, versus a battalion level game. And that's some of the Western Front games uh, have more 
battalion units in it than you'll find on the on the east front but uh, personally i think ocs was sort of born on the east front and uh, is at its best with the east front games but that's a subject for another video uh, on another day the reason that you're going to hear me bring up ocs in this series of videos so much despite the the, the disparity in scale is that when I'm going through Gauss, I see a lot of things that really remind me of various mechanics in OCS. And so therefore you'll hear me uh, kind of comparing the two. And one of those is what I want to talk about today, and that is unit modes in the Gauss system. So let's go ahead and take a little bit of a uh, deep dive, if you will, on unit modes in Gauss. Now this isn't going to be a a detailed tutorial. I'm not going to be teaching you all of the unit mode rules for Gauss, but I will be explaining the rules, uh, hopefully to a point sufficient that you understand how they work, and therefore, you know, my thoughts on them make a little more sense to you, and maybe give you a little better insight into Gauss if you are not familiar with the system, if maybe you've been thinking about it, but have been kind of put off either by uh, the detail or the cost. Uh, so again, one of the goals of this series is hopefully to give people a chance who've heard of Gauss or maybe even haven't heard of Gauss, a good look at the series uh, and give you enough information that you can make up your own minds whether this is something you want to dedicate some of your uh, gaming budget and gaming time to. So with that said, let's go ahead and start our examination of unit modes in Gauss. Now, for those of you familiar with OCS, the concept of unit modes in Gauss is going to be very, very familiar. And if you're not familiar with OCS or unit modes in general, basically the idea is that at the beginning of your player turn, you're going to place all of your units on map into one of several different modes reflecting various unit postures. And this is going to have an impact on their effectiveness in combat and their ability to move. So for example, OCS has combat mode, move mode, strap mode, and reserve mode. In Gauss, there are five unit modes. They are tactical mode, prepared assault mode, strategic mode, exploit mode, and maneuver reserve mode. And I think we're going to start off by taking a look and discussing tactical mode because it's pretty much the most straightforward of the of the five modes. Basically, tactical mode is is the default mode, if you will. If you see a unit that is not otherwise marked with any kind of mode marker, like you can see these prepared assault uh, markers here, then the unit is considered to be in tactical mode. This is kind of a, a balanced mode where the unit is able to move up to its uh, printed movement allowance. And if it is involved in combat, it's going to fight with its printed uh, attack and defense combat strengths. So the, the, the units are uh, able to, to move a fair distance and then also participate in combat. They are able to be designated for tactical assaults. And uh, in Gauss, there are two kinds of ground assaults. Well, I guess three if you include overrun. So uh, you have tactical assaults, prepared assaults, and overruns. And here we are just kind of scratching the surface, talking about unit modes, and I find myself talking about the combat system in Gauss. You know, Gauss is, it's not, it's not the hardest game I've ever played, but I think it's the hardest game to teach someone and for that matter, to try to learn on your own. And the reason for that is actually one of the things that I think is one of the great strengths of the Gauss system. And that is the fact that so many of the subsystems in Gauss are really intertwined with one another. This is a perfect example right here. I'm trying to talk about unit modes and I've got to discuss some combat and combat then is going to be tied into the supply system and, and so on and so forth. So it's, there's just, there's a lot going on here. None of it individually is particularly complex, but they are uh, so interconnected, which to me indicates a really tight uh, 
design, uh, really well thought through design. And quite frankly, I love the fact that decisions you are making in one area of the game are going to have direct impacts on other things. For instance, what mode I'm going to select for my units during the mode determination phase is going to heavily impact what kind of and, and, and where I am able to attack in my upcoming combat phase. Same thing with the supply system. Decisions I make in the supply system are going to affect not just my combat, but also my movement. There are things with the command system where you've got to be careful where you're drawing those various uh, army and core boundaries because of the, uh, the way the supply rules are set up and, and just and so on. I could I could I could really go on about this. Like I said, it's one of the things I really like about the system. But the one negative of that is the fact that because everything references everything else, you've got to you've got to really sort of uh, digest a lot, even though you're trying to maybe just focus on one particular aspect of the of the game. So. That said and out of the way, back to the tactical mode. Again, units can be designated for tactical assaults, which is not the same as tactical mode. So tactical assaults are designated at the beginning of the combat phase, which will come later in your player turn. The first thing you're going to do in your turn is decide what mode each of your units is going to be in for the upcoming turn. And you can change mode from turn to turn. So you're not necessarily locked into your decision beyond your current player turn and your opponent's player turn because when you get to your very next mode determination phase you're able to change up the uh, modes pretty much unrestricted so you're basically deciding what you're going to do this turn with your various formations and then selecting the appropriate or best modes uh, to accomplish what you want done now tactical mode like i said you're able to move a, a fair distance uh, and you're able to you're able to fight, although it's not uh, necessarily you won't be as effective in tactical mode when you launch a tactical assault as you would be if you are in prepared assault mode, making a prepared assault. And since I've mentioned prepared assault, well, let's talk about that mode here briefly. Prepared assault mode or PA mode, is indicated by placing a prepared assault marker on top of the units in question. And we can see here we have two hexes of American units marked as prepared assault, indicating they are in prepared assault mode. Now, GOSS uses a system for its informational markers where the blue colored markers are used for allied units and red markers are used for the Germans. And it's actually kind of a nice system uh, for instance, if you have some entrenchment markers on the map, you know instantly whether there are German or allied units in that, uh, underneath that entrenchment marker simply by the color, either red or blue. Now, prepared assault mode reflects a unit posture that is 100% oriented to combat. So as a result, movement is highly restricted. In fact, leg units, can only move a single hex and mech units are limited to moving up to two hexes so long as that first hex meets certain requirements. Now, in exchange for the movement restrictions, PA units are going to get three major benefits in any attack they make in this uh, upcoming combat phase. And if I can digress briefly for a moment here, what the system seems to be doing with PA mode is accounting for the coordination that I think a lot of games tend to dismiss or not accurately portray that is required for any major or good sized um, attack in the real world. So the time that a tactical mode unit has to move about and drive all over the map, that time for a PA mode unit is instead being spent coordinating with neighboring units, tying in artillery support, and so on. And again, it's, it's one of those nice little features that I really like in the system and, and the way Goss decides to handle this. Now, the benefits of being in PA mode when you make an attack, uh, and this would be a prepared assault as opposed to a tactical assault, is that 
you will get a one odds column shift to the right for any units that are participating in a prepared assault. So in other words, a three to one attack, is, barring any other shifts, is going to be resolved on the four to one column instead of the three to one column, essentially making the attack a little bit more uh, effective than it otherwise would have been. The second benefit that PA gives you is that you can make a multi-hex attack. Now, overruns and tactical assaults in GOSS are limited to being conducted by units in a single hex. So if you look here where we have these two hexes of American uh, units, they could not combine and attack this German engineer battalion or company because they're not marked prepared assault. This hex could conduct a tactical assault or this hex could conduct a, a tactical assault, but only one of those two is going to be able to make the attack. So you can immediately see the benefits that this is going to give you being in prepared assault, where both of these prepared assault hexes, the units are able to combine their strengths to attack the single defending hex. This is going to give you the opportunity to make a more powerful attack, a higher odds attack with a better chance of success. Now, Making a bigger attack means involving more units, and that requires additional coordination reflected by the fact that these guys are pretty much bolted in place prior to launching their attack. You know, when you've got multiple battalions all conducting an attack, the last thing you want to have happen is some friendly uh, fire incidents, and the best way to avoid that is to set out, you know, unit boundaries and make sure that uh, everybody knows where everybody else is supposed to be. And then things like setting up uh, tactical radio nets so that units that are adjacent to one another do have some ability to communicate with each other. There's just, there's a lot involved in any sort of sizable uh, combat. And prepared assault in GOSS reflects the uh, intricacies, if you will, of making such an attack. The third major benefit that you're going to get from being in prepared assault mode is that the capacity on your fire support missions is drastically increased. Now, here we go. This is another example of what I was talking about earlier. I'm still talking about unit modes and now I've got to bring in not just combat, but I'm going to have to talk about our, the artillery subsystem and how Goss handles artillery a little bit. Uh, I'm going to save a deep dive into artillery itself for another episode, but I can't really avoid talking about it here because one of the major benefits of being in PA mode involves artillery usage. In GOSS, uh, they, when artillery fires, it is called a fire support mission, which is kind of a mouthful. So you will usually hear me uh, refer to it either as a fire mission or a barrage or arty barrage, something along those lines. But just know that if I, if you hear me say fire mission or barrage, something to that effect. I'm referring to the fire support mission. Uh, now, these barrages come in three different capacities. There's light, medium, and heavy. The capacity basically limits the number of artillery units that can combine in a single fire mission. And again, this is another one of those little subtle things that uh, Goss reflects that uh, I, I really uh, I really like. The capacity, whether it's light, medium, or heavy, depends upon the spotting unit. And for instance, if you are merely a company-sized unit, you are limited to firing a light capacity barrage, uh, simply because you are not going to have an entire core's worth of artillery assets dedicated to supporting just a single company out of out of that uh, out of that formation. So if you've got a battalion, battalion is going to be more likely to have additional assets sort of dedicated to its support. And finally, if you have a um, a prepared assault underway, which is essentially a major combat operation, you are going to have a large number of artillery assets 
dedicated to supporting this, this big attack. And so the capacity, when you move from a light capacity to medium capacity, the number of units that are allowed to combine and shoot doesn't change that much. It doesn't increase all that much. However, when you go from medium to a heavy capacity, the number of uh, artillery battalions that can participate skyrockets dramatically. So a prepared assault unit making a prepared assault is going to have a lot more artillery available to support it when it makes its attack than somebody making merely a tactical assault. And artillery, I'll just, I, I will say this, I really, really like how they work the artillery system or the artillery in this system. Uh, like I said, I'll have an entire video just dedicated to uh, my thoughts on the artillery system, but spoiler alert, I really, really like it. So you can see prepared assault mode. This is what you're going to use when you are going to make a major effort uh, making an attack against a particular enemy held location. It's going to allow you to make a bigger attack with more units. Those units are going to get combat, uh, uh, column shifts on the combat table and they are going to get a ton of artillery support, assuming of course that you have those battalions available to shoot into the hex. If you're the Americans, chances are pretty good that you're going to have a ton of artillery battalions lying around that you can use to your heart's content in PA mode. So we've talked about tactical mode and PA mode so far. And even though that's only 40% of the various modes that are available in the game system, I would say, based on my experience thus far, that that's probably 80% of your gameplay. You are going to uh, have units in attack mode or PA mode. The other three modes that we're going to talk about here in a moment are all much more situational. And if the unit isn't in that particular situation, then obviously you're not going to be placing it in that mode. So just knowing and understanding these two modes really opens up most of the game to you. And the nice thing is that the rules for both of these modes are the simplest of the of the five unit modes involved. So with that said, let's start to take a look at some of the, I don't want to say obscure, because you will be using these modes uh, from time to time, <clears throat> sometimes more so than others. Uh, these are also the modes that have a little bit more rules weight associated with them. And we'll try to approach these maybe in, I don't want to say order of difficulty, but I guess order of difficulty. Uh, I, I think uh, we'll talk about strategic mode here next as that's one that's fairly straightforward. I think uh, doesn't take too much explanation to really get a feel for. Then we'll move on to exploit mode. And then finally, the maneuver reserve mode, which is actually a pretty cool mode that um, uh, that has a rough um, equivalent in OCS, but it, it is, in fact, uh, I think a little bit different. And uh, it's really interesting how this maneuver reserve mode works. So let's just dive right in with strategic mode. Now, just as PA mode is oriented 100% towards combat. Strat mode is oriented 100% towards movement. When a unit is in strat mode, it's basically got everything packed up on the trucks and vehicles and is concerned about nothing more than just driving as far as they can. Now, the maps in most of the Goss games are quite big. You've seen just how big the Atlantic wall map layout is earlier in this video series. The Wacht am Rhein game is a four mapper uh, and the Lucky Forward has, I believe it's five maps, another big map area. So in order to get units quickly across vast distances, you're going to want to use strat mode. Now, a couple things about strat mode and there are markers provided for that as you can see here you'll simply place the strategic move mode or strat mode marker on the unit in question and it is then considered to be in strat mode now it's only available to mech units or to leg units that are using uh, truck points to uh, for motorization uh, it's another uh, interesting thing <laughs> Here we go, kind of referencing the supply and logistics system with these truck points. We'll talk about truck points down the road when we talk about supply and logistics, but 
Goss allows you to use some of your army level truck assets to motorize leg units in order to give them better mobility. And um, when I say mech unit, I'm really talking about a unit that has a mech class movement. So mech units are anything from a panzer battalion or a tank destroyer battalion to an armored infantry battalion, panzer grenadiers, even a motorized infantry uh, battalion. Anything that's using mechanized movement, meaning it's got a motor and wheels or tracks, is, is, is considered a mech unit for movement purposes in Gauss. So you basically have to have vehicles either inherent to the unit or assigned from the army truck park in order to be able to enter strap mode, which again makes sense because the mode is all about getting from point A to point B as quickly as you can. And there are some restrictions on entering strap mode. For instance, you can't be out of supply or out of command or have any fatigue hits. What it does give you entering strap mode is a 50% bonus to your movement allowance. So in the case of the uh, American CCA unit that we have here from 3rd Armored Division, you can see the printed movement allowance is 12. If I were to place them into strap mode, that's going to become an 18. Now, when you are in strap mode, you may also only use mech road movement. The movement rules in Goss, for the most part, are fairly standard, but they do have a couple of, um, let's say, unique aspects to them. Uh, and we'll talk about that again in a future episode sort of dedicated to how movement works here. But mech road movement basically means that you've got a mech unit that is moving along either a primary road, secondary road, or trail. And you can't switch between mech road movement and non-road movement in the same movement phase which is an interesting element to the game, uh, I think. But, uh, and again, I'll save a discussion of that in detail for later. But just know that when you're moving in strap mode, you're going to be moving along roads. Again, it's all tied into getting uh, the unit to move as far as it can in this particular movement phase. Among some of the other restrictions when you're in strategic move mode, you can't move adjacent to an enemy unit. And that's fairly common, I think, in games that have a, a strategic movement mode. Uh, I think, for instance, you know, OCS has their strap mode, which basically functions the same way as GOSS, although I would say that GOSS has more restrictions on its version of strap mode than OCS does, which, again, ties in with the more detailed nature of GOSS versus, versus OCS. Um, but not only are you restricted from moving adjacent to an enemy unit in strap mode in Goss, but you cannot even enter a hex that's observable by an enemy unit in Goss. And that's because if they can observe you moving along the road, packed up in your trucks, they are going to be calling in artillery on you. So uh, I suspect that it might be a little more of a pain to adjudicate which hexes are observable versus just keeping away from any hexes that are adjacent to an enemy unit. Uh, and that's it's one of the concerns I have regarding playability of Goss, it, or, or little little rules like, like that that are kind of sprinkled in here. And uh, again, I'll talk about this in the move uh, movement episode probably in more detail because I think it it's going to creep up. My concerns I have sort of creep up more in the movement phase than in most other parts of the game. So in addition to the movement restrictions, not adjacent, not in a, an observable hex, strat mode units, they can't spot for any fire support missions. They cannot make any offensive ground assaults. And in fact, they do nothing for anything else involved in ground assaults, meaning they don't provide any bonuses, anything along those lines. And finally, if they are attacked while in strat mode, they actually give the attacker two column shifts in the attacker's favor. So you absolutely do not want to get caught by the enemy in strat mode. And if you're still alive after the combat, you are sort of automatically kicked out of strat mode into the default 
tactical mode. So strat mode is a mode that you're going to use mostly behind the lines where there's little or no possibility of enemy contact. And again, primarily uh, it's designed to get units from, from one position to another position as rapidly as possible. And again, it's, it's a fairly straightforward standard mode. I like how, you know, of the three modes we've discussed so far, you have your, um, you know, pure combat mode with prepared assault mode, and you have your pure movement mode in strat mode, and then tactical mode, which is the default, kind of splits the difference there, giving you a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Now, let's take a look at a couple of the more unique modes that, uh, that Goss has, and we'll start by looking at exploit mode. Well, on second thought, looking at the clock, this episode is starting to get a little lengthy, and the remaining two unit modes, exploit and maneuver reserve, are uh, unique to Goss in many ways, but they're also the most complex of the of the modes and i could probably end up uh talking for another 30 or 40 minutes just on those two modes so rather than make this an extraordinarily long episode i think i'm going to just break it right here we'll call this part one and we'll pick up in the next episode with our discussion of exploit mode then we'll get into maneuver reserve and we're also going to talk about combat reserve which the rules tell us is not a mode but i've got some thoughts about that. So that's going to wrap it up for today. I think also next time, uh, particularly when I talk about the exploit mode, we are going to bring in a little bit of discussion of the sequence of play. And I don't think I've really talked about that much. So we'll throw in some sequence of play discussion along with uh, the rest of the unit modes next time. Appreciate you all watching today. Take care and we'll see you then.